Hello, my name is Rachel. I have the privilege of reading the Bible for us tonight. We actually have two Bible readings uh, this evening. So the first one comes from Genesis and the second one will be in Colossians. So the first reading is Genesis 1 verses 26 to Genesis 2 verse 3. I'll give you a moment to open that up. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Our second reading comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 22, to chapter 4, verses 1, verse 1. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Rachel. Well, good evening. My name's James. I've never had a chance uh, to meet you. Uh, keen to do so afterwards. Particular welcome if you're watching online. We know a lot of people are away on holidays. So good to have you with us. Uh, You might have discovered us online and this will be your first taste of Christchurch St Ives. Welcome. You might be asking, who on earth is this guy? Good question. In preparation for tonight, I sat down and I thought, what are all the things that I have been or still am at my stage of life? So, so far, I have been a student in seven institutions. I've been an office cleaner, a nursing home cleaner, Telephone marketer, Moby Disc DJ, don't ask, don't ask. (laughs) Landscape gardener, opera house concert hall repairman, builder's labourer, brickies labourer, actor, pub doorman, waiter, shoe salesman, babysitter, camp team member, camp director, camp speaker, secondary English and history teacher, minister, husband, dad. Let's talk work. Let's talk about that which requires time, full-time, part-time, overtime, often serious study or apprenticeship, sometimes earning money, sometimes not earning money, hopefully sometimes giving us a deep joy and satisfaction, but even the best of jobs at times are going to bore us silly. It'll be painful We'll ask at some point, what on earth am I doing this here for? Let's talk work. Over the next three weeks, 
uh, we're going to look at this complex matter through the lens of God's word, which means we've got to think about a number of things. The scriptures were written over a millennia in an ancient context, notably different to our own. Many of the roles that I just described, a whole stack of the questions that have already piled in to my inbox and this series would be utterly foreign to the authors of the Old and then the New Testament. I'll give you an example. The first century Mediterranean context of the, the New Testament, so all of the Gospels, all those letters, including Revelation that we started the year with, do you know that upwards of a third of the population were slaves? A third. Now, some of them would have been in chains, working on Roman galleys and deep in mines, but many of them, as bond servants, were high up in administration and government. Many of them ran businesses and whole households and churches. Concepts like work experience, working online, Retirement, weekends, daycare, superannuation, a regulated working week, they, they would have no idea what we're talking about. Because we're going in through the authoritative word of God, an ancient word, it means that we're not likely to get specific answers to often a lot of our modern questions. So what we're going to do tonight and over the next three weeks is provide a, a wisdom framework within which we together can walk and think critically about work. We want to lay, lay deep biblical foundations so that we can shape the sort of decisions that we're making about work, the sort of expectations we might have, the hopes that we invest in our work. The sort of framework that would apply to a Hebrew goldsmith way back in Exodus and the barista at Brew Crew this week. That's the plan. So tonight, we're going to look at what work is good. Then next week, work is frustrated. And then we're going to close it out with work and identity, where Nigel will collect everything I've missed and do it all in one go. <laughs> That's the uh, motto. Nigel will deal with it. This Wednesday, we've got a midweek session, as Tom said. Uh, it's going to be an excellent night. So up here, I'm going, to in, I'm going to interview Bay Warburton and Amy Brown. Both of them became Christians here. Both of them have worked at the highest level of government and business. I want to talk to them about what's it like being a Christian man, a Christian woman, in a work context. We're going to have three breakout seminars. One's on rethinking women and work. Another one on social issues and work. And thirdly, work-life balance. Is that even a thing? Is that even possible? Then we'll come back in and it'll be a big Q&A session where we get to fire some questions at an extended panel up here. It's going to be an excellent night. If you're around, come 7 o'clock, we'll get into it. All welcome. But let's get going on tonight's. Work is good. Rule, subdue, work and keep. When we go back to the beginning and God's account of his ordering or weaving together of all that he's made, we find that we have a unique place in that creation, don't we? We, as men and women, are uniquely made in his image and we're given authority, we're given a role within that creation. It's a role captured in the language of rule, there in 1 verse 26, of subdue or conquer in verse 28, and then into chapter 2, work and keep, 2 verse 15. The picture we're given here is of a good creation that is, a, that is dynamic and it's full of potential. God doesn't just finish the job and hand it to us and say, sit still here. Quite the opposite. It's a dynamic creation full of potential. It is ripe for ordering what is wild, for exploring what is unknown, for naming what is new, for shaping what is raw for cultivating what at that moment is only a seed, for growing what is edible and shepherding what is scattered. A dynamic creation full of potential. If you know, it, in chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, we've got a glimpse of early mining. It speaks of the land of Havilah where the gold is good and there's onyx stones and aromatic resin, which they used to harvest from trees. 
All of this requires rule, subduing, working, keeping, a muscular, active, wise stewarding of the creation. We're not to tiptoe around on the edges of creation. We're not to float above it or beside it. We're to get stuck in with wisdom and energy, with creativity and intelligence, changing, shaping it, forming it to good ends. Now, that might be actual land or livestock, but it might also be a computer program. It might be a team of people at work or a family. All of it is part of God's good creation. Human beings made in the image of God are made to work in whatever corner of that creation we are found and with whatever is to hand. I mean, we get to play with toys and stuff and tech that the earliest humans didn't, but I bet you that there are some skills back there that we have long lost. As those made in his image, we're to work as well as we can in whatever corner of creation we find ourselves with whatever is to hand. Work is a good and right thing. It dates all the way back to the start. Work is not a punishment because of sin. We're going to see next week why work is frustrated because of sin, but work itself is not bad. This week, let's see whatever we're responsible for within creation, it is a noble thing according to God's design. It's a good thing. That, of course, precludes work or does not include work that is clearly immoral. So I think work within the sex industry would fall into that. I think anything that is knowingly, aggressively destructive of human lives, of relationship and the environment also falls into that. But beyond that, all stewarding work has an inherent nobility and value to God. Even if it doesn't have a, that sort of value in the particular culture or day, I would say it's true of every human group that's ever lived that you tend to value the work that pays the most or that might be the most public, that has the most eyes on it, like this role. But did you notice that I included in my list being a student, being a dad, being a husband? No one pays me for that. In fact, I paid, or my mum and dad paid at some point, to be a student. These are just some of the things that I have been or am that don't generate a wage, and yet I think some of that is my most important work. And some of that is where God will start with me when he calls me to account for my work. Not the paid stuff, other things. So in that light, as Tom said earlier on, if you're not in any paid work at the moment, you're, this series is for you. Wherever you find yourself, you might be a student now, you've got that corner of creation, go for it. You might be unemployed, you might be retired, you might be in multiple different roles, none of them paid, this series is for you. The bias of much of what we talk about will be towards paid work, but that's not the sole focus that God makes, nor shall we. We're always stewarding some corner of creation, and I reckon most of us are doing multiple corners around the same time. The question is, who are we working for and how well are we working? So part two, those two questions. If you open the New Testament... You'll see that Paul, who writes a lot of the letters along with Peter and John, is deeply concerned that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, once it takes hold in our life, lands in the everyday life of a man or woman, including work. When we come to Jesus as our saviour, we acknowledge our sin and his death on our account on the cross. We acknowledge that he has risen again from the dead and he is our Lord, our living Lord. His word is our authority. We find as we read that word that we're being treated as men and women who are now set free from slavery to sin. We are forgiven, but we're also responsible agents. We're men and women and youths who are now called upon to make decisions in accord with our new standing with God, our new nature, if you will. And to make those decisions at work, as with everything else. 
That's where Paul goes in the Colossian letter. In chapter 3, he starts by addressing slaves or bond servants, as we heard of before, and then he goes to masters, slaves. Obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favouritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. So that Christian slave now has two masters, two levels of accountability. And if you happen to be a master, you have a Lord who is greater than you. This has a profound impact, I think, on what we make of work. Would you agree that most, of, most people tend to read us or value us or identify us often on what we're doing? Oh, you're a student, uh, you're an accountant, you're this, you're that. We often get identified according to our particular role. But God defines us according to where we stand with him on relational terms. See, whether we're a slave or master in an ancient world, whether we're a team member or a, or a, a manager or a student now, our ultimate identity and allegiance is to the Lord Jesus. Our work does not own us. He does. He does. And reverence for the Lord, a deep love for him, is to be our basic posture every day. Whatever we wake up to do this week, whatever we log on for, whatever we get dressed in, whatever that role is, according to Colossians 3, it is the Lord Christ I am serving. So if you're in the habit of writing helpful verses somewhere, how good is this one? Whatever we are up to, it doesn't care whether you're at home, you're at a work site, whatever, it is the Lord Christ I am serving. Could you put that somewhere helpful this week? We might have a great boss who's a pleasure to serve. We might have one who's difficult or indifferent. We might have a boss we've never even met her, wouldn't have a clue who he is. But this passage says whatever we do in every context, we have a heavenly boss and Lord who is right here and present, who is watching closely, who knows us inside out, and the nature of our work. So how does this dual level of accountability, having two bosses, shape the way that we work? We're to be absolutely obedient, we're to be alert to the nature of the work that God's given us, and we are to do it. Now, that doesn't mean that we do immoral or illegal tasks, or ones that collide with our conscience, and most of us at some point, depending on the sort of work that we've either been in or will be in, are going to have to learn to say no sometimes at work. That's hard. For some, that will risk the job itself. But at some point, we've got to say no. It might be to the na or some part of the job itself, or it might be the culture around the job. If, if you were here with us at the men's night earlier this year, some of the big questions asked of the guys that were speaking was, what do you do with a drinking culture around what we do? Really insightful night. So this obedience to your master does not mean a blanket or blind yes to everything. But Colossians 3 does say we are to have an absolute level of integrity in our work, whether it is public or it is private. See, others might think that they can get away when no one's watching them or rip off workers if they can get away from government oversight. But this tells us, I know that I have a Lord who is wide awake, utterly attentive, who knows what I'm doing, whether I'm a master or a slave. In verse 25, he is alert to all injustice and he will bring it to account how much of a comfort is that to the slave then or now who feels they have no, no power, who's being bullied at work, treated appallingly? God knows. 
This tells us that he is intensely invested and interested in what we do. Otherwise, he wouldn't bother judging. It's also a testing word, isn't it, for those jobs which allow some or all work from home or a wholly online presence. As men and women of God, we should be utterly trustworthy to work with sincerity of heart when the camera is on or when we're just alone. Are we doing even the driest tasks really, really well? Doing whatever we do with all our heart as ultimately working for the Lord, not for people. So my fa- one of my favourite examples of this is a guy who had a deep shaping hand in the life of Steve Day. Now many of us might know Steve, he was a former warden, uh, he's just so busy about the place. Steve and Marie are a deep, deep blessing to this church. May you meet them one day if you've not met them yet. Steve, as a boy, his dad moved the family to New Zealand and they bought a chicken farm, big poultry farm. And early on in the piece, this guy just backed his truck up to one of the sheds, got out with a big shovel and just started shoveling chicken poo into the back. And his dad came out and go, can I help you? Like, what's this? And he explained that, well, the previous owner, there was a deal, there was an understanding that uh, I'll take the poo away and I'll make a fertiliser out of it and you get to be relieved of it. And so, well, okay, all right. Walk back home, walk back to the the house and he could hear something happening out in the shed. This guy's shoveling away and he's singing at the top of his voice really badly, but he's singing hymns. He's singing praise to Jesus and he's just drawn magnetically to this shed. And they come here like, what's this guy doing? He's shoveling poo and singing praise to Jesus. It was so out there, he, just, he had to find out what is the deal with this guy. And there in the chicken shed, this guy shared the gospel with Steve Day's dad, who had no experience of church, no interest in God whatsoever. And later that day, he gave his life to the Lord. And then he was so transformed that his wife said, what's, I don't know what you do, but I want it. And she came to the Lord and the whole family was brought into the kingdom by a guy shoveling chicken poo and singing the praises of God. If that guy can do that, we can do the driest, most boring job and do it as to the Lord, not for men, praising God as we go and making ourselves alive and alert to what the Lord might do with that. Are we such men and women, whatever God has got us doing? Let's just be sure we know when to put the shovel down. The fact that God owns us, not our work, means that we need to guard our time of rest. Some jobs can be left at the work site, but we know, don't we, many others can easily colonise our waking hours simply via the phone and the laptop. Obeying earthly masters in everything does not include being available to them every waking minute, either because they expect it or we allow it. Some of you are at work that wants you available right now and is doing everything it can to take your attention away from what's happening this instant. Don't allow it. We will work far better if we refuse to work all the time. Do you believe that? I'm old enough and I hope wise enough to know that that is true. I'm a far better minister to you guys if I have my day of rest on a Wednesday. I down tools and step away. I'm going to say more on Sabbath on Wednesday night, but the God-given principle of rest, embedded in creation, given to God's people in Exodus, as we've seen, needs to be thought about seriously, creatively, deliberately. Rest is not sleep. Let me say that again. Rest is not sleep. It is wide awake, God-centred time. Contrary to that popular notion, the time off is really just about recharging for the main game, which is work or study or both. True rest in God's terms is a decision to down tools in some way at some time and remember that we belong to Him. Rest is that point where we put aside the immediate 
and we remember the ultimate truths of who we are in Christ. It's that time in the week that makes sense of the rest of the week. It's like the axle around which all other things, work included, turns. In the relentless hustle that many of us feel, are we resting in that sense? When we are, I think we're far more likely to get a grasp on what Paul writes in Colossians 3 verse 24. So part three, what's our inheritance? Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Now in the ancient world, slaves had no inheritance. So this would have caught their ear immediately. Wow, there's something coming for all this. What is it? There is a, a, a quite a popular and growing sense uh, or belief of school of thought around at the moment that believes that all of what we make and work is somehow contributing to God's end product. A reformed, redeemed culture, city, earth, then that's somehow our inheritance, our work inheritance. Now, I've got no doubt from personal experience, but also just from history, that Christian men and women and churches can and have had a profound impact on workplaces, on a neighbourhood, on a city, on an industry, on a culture. We know, don't we, from God's Word, He is concerned for justice now. He wants us to be compassionate with all that we have now, in our time, in our place. If you're familiar with what happened in the, late, the mid to late Roman Empire, when the Gospel took hold, when Christians started to be in positions of influence, the changes make you want to weep for joy. The beauty of what it meant for government and those in power to take in the most vulnerable. It's beautiful and it's mighty and it came out of a Gospel logic. It's the same for those heroes that fought and defeated slavery in the 18th and 19th century. Christian men and women drove that and drove it hard. I think being a Christian should be really, really good for the work that we do, whatever that work is. And there's an open question for you. How does being a follower of Jesus help shape the very work that I do? It might be vast, it might be small. But history tells us that Christians do make a difference. But we've got to know this, none of it lasts. None of it lasts. God pays super close attention to what we do, but He doesn't somehow preserve the best of the stuff or our roles for the new creation to come. Jesus refers to it in 5, 5.18. He speaks of heaven and earth disappearing. In Hebrews 2, the earth and the heavens that we saw back in Genesis, God himself making by hand, these things will perish. At Easter this year, we opened Revelation 21, which speaks of a new heavens, a new earth coming, something much to be desired. For all of it is to be remade. Everything we do and say, create and cultivate matters deeply to God but all of it is fleeting in one way or another. And when you sit down and think, so much of that is just obvious, given the nature of so many roles that many of us are involved in. I'm going to say more on this next week, but common sense tells us. I had some brilliant Year 12 classes 25 years ago, but if I ran into some of those guys and said, I'm still in Year 12, sir, I think that's just nuts. I must have blown it. The whole point is to move on and up and further on. Tonight, we're going to be cooked dinner. And everyone in that kitchen, they don't want the food sitting there. They want empty plates. It's there to be consumed, enjoyed, had fellowship around. But to go. Your mums and dads want you to grow up and eventually move out, hopefully before 30. A builder might hope that the structure lasts 100 years, but probably not. Now, I'm going to ask Tom to bring up this particular item. This, my friends, 
is a piece of 1930s office technology. This wooden box contained many, many like it, over 40 years of a stellar medical career. My dad's handwritten notes on babies born, women in confinement, complexities around those births, likely things that needed to be guarded against, the sort of medication given, box upon box upon box of handwritten notes, thousands of lives impacted by one doctor's career. What's in this box now? My socks. <laughs> My socks. This which sat at the heart of a high-end medical career is now very useful for my socks. That career is over and Dad's gone home to be with the Lord. What are you working on now? What are the materials and things that make up the work that you do that one day might be fit for socks? None of it lasts. Whatever the task might be, whatever the job is, you know that there's going to be no lawyers, no defence personnel, no insurance needed in heaven. There's no police, doctors, nurses, bankers or preachers. I'm going to be out of a job and so will you. Now I suspect that there are work, there's work to be done in heaven. There's almost, almost endless ways we might be serving in that kingdom to come. But the stuff and essential roles we have now do not last so what then is our inheritance from the Lord? In short, it is the Lord himself and it is people. It is people. In Colossians 1, uh, Paul speaks of their faith in Christ Jesus and their love for all God's people. Faith and love, where does it come from? It springs up from the hope stored up for them in heaven. In 1 verse 12, Paul gives thanks that Jesus qualified them and us to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Heaven is very human. It's very flesh and blood. It's all about who, where we often just think about the what. That's what's to come. When God looks at us, the world and our workplaces, we might think that people come and go, but we actually are the permanent feature according to God's design. All else will eventually stop or fade away. We have a habit, don't we, of asking up front, what do you do? But I think if Jesus was milling around with us after the service and having dinner, his first question was, who do you work with? Who's your team? What, what are your patients like? Who are your customers? It's about people. God's not going to assess, you know, he's not going to assess that current work project that you're doing on the last day, but he will call to account everyone who's working on it and those who will be shaped by it. Especially we who carry his name into that workplace. So whatever your work is or might be, are we more concerned for the what of work or the who of work? Money really, really matters. Money is important. We need income, don't we? But is our work more about the money or the many who are yet to hear about Jesus? People in the relationships we have are what matter most. And it's our godly integrity, our readiness to share the gospel in word and action that concerns him and constitutes our inheritance we go at work in godly ways that pleases our heavenly Lord. Welcome home, good and faithful servant. We look for opportunities to speak up as the chicken guy did. He didn't back his truck up that day looking to convert a family. He just came to do his job, praise the Lord as he did it. And that caught the ear and the moment came and he shared the gospel. That's banked in heaven. That pleases the Lord and builds the kingdom. There is his inheritance in action. Will that be our inheritance? That's why the section before this in Colossians 3, it's all about putting off, repenting of, getting rid of 
all the things that destroy relationships and grieve our Heavenly Father and putting on all the stuff that He loves, all the things that bear the stamp of Jesus' character and a transformed life, our life in Him. You know that Jesus could have revolutionised Nazarene carpentry, could have changed the game. He could have transformed Galilean fishing industry like nothing else on the planet. He could have kick-started a new era in Palestinian health. And he could have wiped the Romans from the slate and gotten rid of all slavery. But he didn't. He didn't do any of that. He came to save people like you and me and those that we work with, study with, those that we live with, play with, so that we might share together in the inheritance of his holy people in that kingdom of light that is coming. A salvation and inheritance that needs to be heard by others if they are to respond. That's why here we're always on the hunt, aren't we? We're always looking for ways to share the life that God's given us, to speak of the gospel, to equip one another, to seek those who might step into that telling, equipping, gospeling work full-time. That's the point of MTS, the Ministry Training Scheme. Get a taste for what it might be to do this full-time before you actually do it. We're looking for those who will do that in a way that will help equip all of us, God's people, for telling out in whatever context we're in. In John 4, Jesus commands, we pray for God to send more people into the harvest field. And we want to be obedient to that, don't we? In what we pray, what we act, what we do. Either by going ourselves or making sure we back those who do. Is that you? Well, in conclusion, some of you may know this man. Eric Little was a Scotsman. He was born in China in 1902 to missionary parents, but grew up in Scotland. He was a phenomenally able young man, capable in all sorts of ways. He had the whole world at his disposal, but he was most famous for running. This guy was a a fast, powerful runner. He played on the wing for Scotland rugby team. And if you know the film, the 1981 film Chariots of Fire, it tells about the build-up to his most famous race. He won the 400 metres at the 1924 Paris Olympics. A stunning victory. But then after that, he left and he went to China for the mission field. And he died there in 1945, still a young man in a prisoner of war camp. If you know the movie... Earlier on, before the Olympics, he's standing on Arthur's seat, which is this stunning hill that overlooks his native Edinburgh. And he's talking to his sister, Jenny, the character in the film. And he says, I believe that God made me for China, for the mission field. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. He knew that God's greatest concern is for people to know Jesus And in his head and heart, he had committed himself to that work long term. But he also knew the living God well enough to know that his heavenly father had enough delight in one of his own, running as hard as he could for the few minutes or less that it took to get to the tape. Friends, it is my prayer. May each of us, in whatever we do for work, whatever corners of creation God finds us in tonight that we might know something of our Heavenly Father's pleasure as we do our very best in what God's given us to do. We strain our heads, our hearts and hands in ultimate service to Him, not just people. Whether it's as brief as a race or it's a lifelong career, the way that we rule, we subdue, we work, we keep matters deeply to God. Such work is good, it's basic to our design. Whilst we work for earthly masters, in the end, all of us work for the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one we are serving. Now, whilst being a Christian is good for the work itself, it's the who of work, not the what, 
that counts in the end. Who are you working with? Who do you work for? Who's around you in your work context, whatever that might be? Let's pray and look for every opportunity to share life, share Jesus and the difference that he makes in our lives. It might mean singing loudly and badly as you shovel something. We'll find its equivalent in whatever we do. Spark the interest in those around you. And when the opportunity comes, as Beck shared, to say, why do you lead the way you lead? Say it. Explain it. When Edwina is not treating herself as others do, but is spending money in a godly way, and others go, why? There's the chance. There's the opportunity. All else is going to fade and stop, but people are permanent. People are what matter most to God. And in Jesus, we, and we trust they, have a brilliant, brilliant inheritance. James, heaps of questions came through about money, uh, which I'm really excited about. Can I just highlight a couple of things before that I loved from what you said? I love that you talked about how God's alert to injustice and he'll bring it to account because I know that some people probably feeling like their boss is treating them unjustly and so it's good to hear that God is alert to that and mm, bring it to account. Yeah. Um, and I love that you started talking about MTS, you know, like if someone here was thinking about, I want to give work for the law to go, MTS is an awesome option. Yeah, it's great. Now, with all of that said, can I throw a couple of money questions at you and group them together? Um, because I think a lot of us, when we think about work, we're thinking about, oh, I, you know, I was earning not many dollars when I was at school or uni or whatever. And th if I get to working as a full-time job, I've dramatic change. So we're very interested in money and how to use it. So one person says, how can we justify buying a million dollar house in or around Sydney when we definitely don't need that much comfort or space, could give the money to the needy? Then Ethan asked, is it against God's will for Christians to have wealth that's beyond our own needs, like the believers at the act, at start of Acts 5 compared to the Acts, end of Acts 4? And uh, Lucas said, what's the balance between using money to serve God and buying things for leisure? Yeah, um, really important. Thing. Can I encourage you, those of you who are first of all just starting to lean into work or those who are newly married and have thought about our money, uh, get into the habit early of saying, of, of starting with what you give towards mission, uh, like to ministry, it might be church but other things as well, then build back from that. I say that because we can, you can get into habits of spending, habits of using money and then you've kind of got to pull yourself back a little bit. So I think one of the key, the key verses in this regard is in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6. Command those who are rich in this present world. And the truth is, all of us, even though there'd be a, quite a range of income in this room, uh, we are rich in this world. Compared to the 98% you know, of the rest of the planet, we are the rich. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. So there's the danger, that somehow having a lot of money makes me secure, or the hope of having a lot of money will actually get me there to some better place. So, that's, so money's not evil, but the love of money is profoundly dangerous, very dangerous. So don't be arrogant, put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So I want to say that as someone who's grown up in Sydney, who has, has never known what it is to have an empty fridge without clothing and the thing, I am profoundly thankful to God. I want to be humbled by that fact, not arrogant and proud and snobby. And I think I have been at different times in my life. So the, the fact of where I have been born and who I was born to, the sort of house I grew up in, so thankful to God. So now as one who is now has, you know, is in a house provided by you guys, who has certain resources, my call here is, how will I be, what sort of posture will I have with our money? So it says, uh, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And this is what excites me. I know a number that are, are far richer than me, but are so godly with their money that it's inspiring because they realise this gives an opportunity to invest deeply in ministries 
to actually give people the freedom to go and do things, to do the sort of stuff that many of us would love to do and invest in, but we just never have that facility. So those who have the, have the money see it as this is now not just a responsibility, but it's an opportunity to serve with the money. Yeah. Um, and I think just the last point, and we'll come back to this next week, in this way they will lay out treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so they might take hold of the life that is truly life. Are we using our money in heavenly ways? Is our money enough for us, but also is it an opportunity to help others? Mm. That doesn't answer that whole question. It's a big, big topic. But sit in 1 Timothy 6, 17 and following. See where you sit in that, as I need to sit in it as well. Yeah, that's so good. You took us to 1 Timothy 6. Um, a book that really transformed my understanding of money... Um, uh, neither Poverty Nor Riches is the title. You can just Google it. If you get a really badly designed grey cover, you know you're in the right place for that book. I'll post it. If you're in the group chat, get on the group chat. I'll drop it in there. Change the way I think about money. And part of that was 1 Timothy yeah. 6. Hey, we've got time probably just for the one more. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, where'd the grey zones question go? Yeah, from Sam. How does a Christian decide to work or not work a job that is more grey area, e.g. army, food industry, etc.? What if there are no Christians? I'm not sure about the grey area of food. I mean, I'm not into Mexican, but I don't think there's a moral thing not to work there. Um, I, I guess there would be some aspects of the food okay, industry yes, like, that like, could like, be... Yeah, so where the food comes from, how the food is produced. I think really that is a matter of your own conscience. You've got to be clear before God that I can work here to the very best that I can in this particular industry. Mm. And so I know a number of Christians who have been involved in the armed forces. Um, I've known um, Ros uh, Lloyd this morning shared that someone said there's an excellent job going at Aristocrat, the gambling place, and she just said, I can't do it. I cannot give myself to that industry. Um, so these are conscience calls that I think we need to be really careful with. If you're feeling like... I don't know if this is right, then I think just seek wise counsel. Uh, come and have a talk to some of your leaders, you know, bring it up in your growth group as a matter for prayer. But I think that's really important that we are aware and alert as much as we can to the full orb of our workplace. Um, even the best industries will give themselves to, as we'll see next week, corruption, uh, real, you know, bad behaviour. So even the nature of the work might be fine, but the people in it may not be. But if the nature of the work itself... It's like, so if a war breaks out, some will be fine with going into the armed forces, but others in good conscience, I'm going to have to step back and serve a different way in a battle. That I don't think there's a hard, fast word from God on those matters. Um, so I think you, our conscience is really vital. If our, we've got a bad conscience about what we're doing, we're not likely to give our heart to that matter, and we're going to sit at an awkward angle to the entire thing, and that will be very clear to our peers. That's a bad place to be. Yeah. That's so good. Um, I love the heart behind both of those questions. So I hear a generous heart and I hear a soft heart when it comes to moral issues. I just love that. Um, let me pray. Mm -hmm. We're going to sing, close out service. God, thank you so much for the people in this room who are thinking deeply about their work. God, please help us to work for you. Uh, please help us to give ourselves um, fully to um, working as if your eye is on us because it is. Uh, whether we're working in a really obvious gospel way or a um, kind of a normal job, uh, we ask that you would help us to do that as for you uh, with all the slaves and the masters stuff in mind. God, thank you for um, those of us who have jobs. God, for those of us who wish we had jobs, we ask for that. Um, God, we ask for those especially who are dreading going to work tomorrow uh, and that you would give them some measure of comfort mm -hmm. knowing that God has his eye on bosses who are treating us poorly. Everybody who agreed said... Amen. Oh,